Well, welcome back to our next unit in our Connect series. We're going to be learning about Jesus the Savior in this next unit of five lessons. And the symbol that we have for today is going to be our palm branches. We're going to look at Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. And palm branches were significant in that they were signs of victory, okay? So placing them at Jesus' feet um, would have paved his way with victory, right? They were The people were welcoming him to Jerusalem and treating Jesus as if he had already won, as if he had already defeated Rome. Uh, they welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem as people would have welcomed their king home from victory over their enemies. So we'll dive into a story we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. So bookmark that in your Spark NRSV Bibles, and you can read that later. I'm going to give you a little context right now. So it looks like for hundreds of years, the Jewish people had been waiting for a savior. They'd been living under the oppression of Rome. Rome had conquered them and were ruling over them and weren't very friendly to them. Uh, through slavery and exile and oppression, Israel had hoped that one day, one day, a Messiah would appear and free God's people forever. They would never have to live under the oppression of anybody else. The people expected a Messiah who would be a powerful king or a warrior or ruler uh, that would rule over all the nations. But when Jesus arrived in Jerusalem, he didn't ride on a king's chariot or, or on a general's steed or horse. He did not take over the government. An army of soldiers did not accompany him. Instead, it was a bunch of fishermen. Jesus entered one of the most important cities in the world, the very home of the temple and the centerpiece of Jewish religious life. And he entered on a donkey. So a reading from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethage, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna! Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. So some people recognized Jesus' importance and they worshipped him with cries of Hosanna, son of David. They knew that a Messiah would come through the line of David, King David. They took off their cloaks and they laid them on the road in front of the donkey. Uh, they cut palm branches down and spread them out before Jesus. Uh, but most people in Jerusalem likely saw the strange procession for this humble man and said, who is this guy? Uh, those who recognized Jesus as Messiah expected him to lead in a very different way. Many didn't realize he was the Messiah at all. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, some people were excited to worship him. Others didn't know who he was. The people were expecting a Messiah who would ride in on a great steed, a beautiful horse, and radically overthrow the government. And instead of soldiers with swords, he showed up with fishermen and nets. <laughs> instead, Jesus rode into the city on a humble donkey. Now, one of the things that I like to think about is who would be important people that we might welcome to our city today? Um, you know, what would be the reactions uh, of people as, as Jesus arrived into this city? How would you welcome Jesus if he rode into our church building? <laughs> or into our town, um, right down Main Street. Now, I have uh, our project that we worked on today, so you're supposed to kind of cut out your donkey, right? And roll it up here, and then get your palm branches. And we were gonna get together as a group and have like a race and see whose donkey could finish the race first. So instead, what I'm gonna encourage you to do is once you've got your donkey made and your palm branches made, Set this down somewhere in your house, maybe start in your bedroom or your front door, 
and try and race your donkey through all the different rooms of your house, if possible. Just have fun with it. See if you can do that and see how long it takes. It might take a while because this donkey at least likes to go in circles. Um, and each room you get into, I want you to say, Jesus is welcome here. So get your donkey going. And as it goes into each room, say, Jesus is welcome here. And it'll be kind of a form of blessing as you bless the various rooms of your home. And remember to honor and welcome Jesus' presence in each area of our lives. Jesus, you are welcome here. My donkey is out of control. <laughs> <laughs> now I can remember when I was in high school, our family was visiting my aunt and uncle who lived out of state and we just happened to be driving and got our it, traffic stopped. All, you know, the lights were all stopped and we had all these police officers coming by on motorcycles and cars and lights and we couldn't figure out what was going on. We started seeing limousines, we started seeing big black SUVs. We turned on the radio and we realized that uh, the President of the United States at the time his motorcade was driving through this town that we were in. And so it was kind of cool. We got to stop our cars, get out and look and wave and just see this really long motorcade of vehicles going by. It's kind of interesting when you think about it, like what, what does a person's vehicle tell you about that person and how important they may be, right? Do you assume something about somebody if they're riding on like a little moped or a little tiny scooter versus uh, a big Harley Davidson motorcycle. Um, what about a new fancy car? Do you think differently about somebody who's driving around town in a big new fancy car or a broken down rusted bucket of a car? Um, how does that change the way we think about people depending on what they're riding on? You know, if a king or queen rode into Champaign-Urbana today, uh, what would they be riding in or on? Um, if you attended the event <laughs> to welcome this king or queen, what would you be riding in or on? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting uh, to think about. The people shouted that Jesus was the son of David. Um, what do you think that title meant and, and why was it so important? You know, I talked about how the Jewish people expected a savior to come from the line of David. If you saw a procession of people worshiping and shouting in the streets, how would you react? Uh, what would... You know, what would you be asking about the people going by? Um, would you ask people, who is this? Would you join in the parade? Sometimes it just gets exciting when you see people cheering and, and having fun and welcoming somebody. Even if you don't know who it is, you might just jump in. Our next reading follows our previous reading from Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 through 17. So I'll go ahead and read that. Um, and before I do, you know, you can bookmark that in your Bible and go back and read it later. I want to remind you that Jerusalem was an important city because the temple was there, right? And it was the point where European, Asian, and African trade routes all intersected. So you had all kinds of cultures and languages and money and types of traditions that were all crossing paths. Jesus was marching into the center of the known world. If Jesus were to march into an important place today, what would be considered the center of the known world? What big city would we think of as kind of the center of the known world. Where would Jesus go today? Um, the temple was a central place for purification in Jerusalem. People came from all around uh, to make sacrifices, animal sacrifices in the temple, according to Jewish law. But the temple authorities were overcharging people and exploiting them, uh, exploiting the very people they were supposed to serve. Instead of combating Rome uh, and those who were oppressing the Jewish people, Jesus unexpectedly confronts injustice in his own people. In the temple, he points out how his own Jewish leaders are oppressing their own people. No one expected a prophet of Yahweh to condemn the temple and its systems set up there. So then Jesus did something even more unexpected. He began healing unclean people in the temple. And people begin to ask, who is this prophet? So a reading from Matthew chapter 21, verses 12 through 17. Then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he cured them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the amazing things he did, 
and heard the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They became angry and said to him, Do you hear what these people are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read, Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise for yourself? And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and spent the night there. So Jesus went into the temple in Jerusalem and discovered that people were taking advantage of foreign worshipers who had come to convert their currency from their home countries. Uh, the temple dealers were charging high prices for sacrificial animals, and they knew um, that it was necessary for these people to sacrifice these animals in order to be forgiven for their sins, so they could pretty much charge whatever they wanted. They had a monopoly on these animals that they were selling in the temple. In Leviticus, the book of Leviticus, it's one of the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those are called the Torah, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. In Leviticus, it has a bunch of laws, and God gives Moses some laws, and he says there should be three types of animal sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins. There's bulls, there's lambs, and there's doves. If you were rich, you would buy a bull to sacrifice to forgive your sins. If you were middle class, you would buy a lamb for, your, for the forgiveness of your sins. And if you were poor, you could afford a dove, because doves were pretty common. You could find them pretty much anywhere, and they were cheap to buy. So God made it so that everyone could be forgiven. No one would be able to be denied forgiveness because they were too poor. Everybody would be able to buy an animal to then be sacrificed, to then be forgiven. But here were these greedy money changers making it harder for poor people to afford forgiveness from God. And Jesus believed that that was just wrong. That's unjust. And he believed that the temple should be a place for healing and purification, not for greed. So how would you have reacted if you had been there and you'd seen Jesus flipping tables over, right? Um, what if, you know, back in worship in our church building, you know, um, Jesus started flipping pews over or knocking things over off the altar or in the narthex because we were selling things and, and being greedy. Maybe not just selling things, but ripping people off. Remember, these people were ripping off foreigners that didn't know any better. And if you think about it, what are ways today? that we rip off foreigners without them knowing it. Take advantage of the things that they don't know. Take advantage of the fact that they can't speak our language. It's good to remember that Jesus experienced all types of emotions that we experience. Joy, sadness, laughter, anger. Jesus felt all of these things that we feel. This is one of the main reasons I believe and love Jesus and believe in God, especially through Christ Jesus, is because God knows what it feels like to be human. But when Jesus got angry, it was at injustice. And I think about the things I get mad at, and they're usually pretty dumb things. Like, I get, you know, in traffic, if somebody's cutting me off or goes flying past me, or, you know, we just get mad about dumb stuff. But when Jesus gets angry, he gets angry at injustice. He gets angry at things that matter. So I want us to think about that. What is an injustice in the world? What is something going on in the world that makes you really angry, like really upsets you? And then I want you to think, what might God be calling you to do about that? You know, we can pray about God solving the different problems of the world, but I think it's important to think about what is something that makes us angry that's happening in the world, and then think about maybe God is calling us to do something about that. All right, another reading from Luke chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. Uh, before I read this, another, some more context, right? So Jesus was not a violent conqueror. We talked about that. He didn't come in with a military and an army. Um, he came in with disciples that were taught how to love and to heal. But because he wasn't a violent conqueror, he disappointed many people, right? Nevertheless, Jesus cared deeply for Jerusalem and God's people. He wanted to save them in a very different way than what they had expected. In this passage I'm about to read, Jesus looks upon Jerusalem and he cries. He gets sad. Um, he wants to gather up the people like a mother hen gathers her young under her wings. This is one of the few images that we have in scripture of God being referred to as a woman, a mother hen, uh, loving her children. So we're going to think about who is this Messiah. So Luke chapter 13 verses 34 through 35. 
Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Remember, Jerusalem was and is a large and important city in the Middle East. And when Jesus spoke about Jerusalem, he spoke with compassion and sadness. He saw many of his own people who had turned their backs on God. And he was sad for them. He wanted better for them. He knew that the people of that city would not recognize him as the Messiah. And he also knew that he would die there in Jerusalem one day. So thank you again for joining me as we did our Connect lesson here on Jerusalem. And we're learning a little bit about the city of Jerusalem welcoming the Messiah and how he was welcomed. And I'll look forward to more lessons with you next week. So before we go, make sure you get some water with you. Dip your finger in the water. Make a little sign of, of blessing and say, we are blessed. I am blessed to be a blessing. I am blessed to be a blessing. Amen. Amen. God's peace this week.